Hello and welcome and thank you for joining us. I'm Rochelle, I'm the Development Director here at Trinity Hall and we're delighted to partner with the college's newly reformed literary group, the Hesperides Society, for the event this evening. We've had over 100 people register to hear conversation with alumnus and honorary fellow Nicholas Heitner. We've had alumni register from all decades through from the 1950s to current day students and we have people watching in 11 countries around the world. There will be the opportunity for the audience to ask questions at the end and we would ask that you post these in the chat box. Before we begin the conversation, I'd like to hand over to the President of the Hesperides Society, student Matt Besant. Hello and welcome to the launch event of the refounded Hesperides, a literary society that was originally founded by Neil McLeod Innes in the early 1920s. This new centenary revival came about when I stumbled across the Hesperides dinner mentioned in the memoirs of T.S. Eliot, and I subsequently went on to discover the many renowned figures the society has hosted, such as the critic George Steiner, art historian Nikolaus Pevsner, and playwright J.B. Priestley. Much of what we now know of the society's past is thanks to the old Hesperidians, many of whom I know are here today, who took the time to reach out with their own anecdotes and stories. And an enormous thank you to all those who contacted me. While maintaining links with its past, the refounded Hesperides will be a forward-looking community for those that love all things literary, whether that be seminal classics, trashy page turners, epic poems, or groundbreaking works for the stage. Which leads me on to introduce our esteemed guest today, Nicholas Heitner, who will discuss his time at Cambridge and his career since with Dr. Daniel Tyler. Nicholas, who read English at Trinity Hall in 1974, is director of the London Theatre Company, which opened its first theatre, The Bridge, in 2017, and will open another in King's Cross in 2021. His productions of The Bridge include Young Marx, Julius Caesar, and A Midsummer Night's Dream. He was director of the National Theatre from 2003 to 2015, where he directed plays by Alan Bennett, Shakespeare, and Ben Johnson, as well as a wide range of new plays. He delivered a repertoire of 20 productions a year, including War Horse and The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime, and introduced National Theatre live cinema broadcasts around the world. He has worked widely in opera in London, Paris, Munich and New York, and in film, having directed The Lady in the Van and The Man of King George. His theatre awards include three Olivier's, three Tony's and five Evening Standard Awards. His book Balancing Acts was published by Jonathan Cape in 2017. He is an honorary fellow at Trinity Hall, honorary doctor of letters at Cambridge University, honorary doctor of fine arts at the Juilliard School, and he was knighted in 2009. Dr. Daniel Tyler is the acting vice master at Trinity Hall and is our director of studies in English. He was previously a departmental lecturer at Balliol College, Oxford. Most of his research focuses on 19th century literature, especially fiction, with a particular interest in the way that matters of form, style, and technique shape meaning. He has edited Dickens's The Uncommercial Traveller for Oxford University Press, as well as a collection of essays on Dickens's style, which demonstrates the rewards of attending in detail to Dickens's verbal technique. It is my pleasure to welcome both Nicholas and Daniel for a conversation tonight that launches a new era for the Hesperides. Thank you. Well, it's, it's a great pleasure to be joined by Nick Heitner this evening. Um, Nick, thanks, thanks so much for joining us. I'm really happy to be here. Um, we've, I'm very much looking forward to this conversation and to um, talk, talking with you about your career and, and your, your experiences. Um, I wonder if I could start by asking whether um, you knew, uh, how early on you knew that you wanted to go into the theatre or performing arts? Oh gosh, I think, uh, I, think I, I was a stage struck and stage obsessed, theatre obsessed school, school kid and um, it took me a while to say out loud that um, I think it was while I was at Trinity Hall that I found I found I found it possible to say out loud that it was what what I wanted to do professionally. Um, as far as being a director is concerned, uh, it's quite an odd, um, dysfunctional thing to want to be um, from the get go. Uh, to want to be a director rather than an actor or a, write, or a writer um, is pretty suspect. I, I, most of the directors I know have tried to act or tried to write, found out they're no good, and have become directors as a kind of um, as a kind of last resort. It then turns out um, if you apply yourself to it, and if you're lucky enough to get the right kind of apprenticeship, um, to be well, I, I guess I kind of would say this: uh, the best job in the theatre. But it was, but I certainly, when I arrived at Cambridge, um, 
I still thought, I still thought in a frivolous way that I might want to be an actor and found out kind of within weeks that there were any number of people who were better than me and started to get really interested in what it would be like to direct. Um, so you so you ca you came to Cambridge as you say and and studied English at Trinity Hall, which seems like an eminently sensible thing to do. Um, what you were um, how far did the did your studies in English contribute to your thinking about um, the theatre and and your career? Well, I think they do they did and they do and they still do, and in in a very practical way they still do when I'm doing uh, Shakespeare. Um, I, the first person I call is always Peter Holland, who taught me when I was at Trinity Hall and now teaches at uh, uh, Notre Dame in, uh, in Indiana. Um, so um, the way I approach a classical text um, is still greatly influenced by the way I read English and the way I was taught. Um, there's a flip side um, and, it, and it applies to all um, university educated directors, which these days, to my regret, um, is nearly all directors. Uh, you come out of the academy, you come out of universities, and particularly now that there are so many more, um, there are so many more uh, theatre studies and drama courses available, um, not just English courses. Um, uh, you come out, you think you probably know it. Um, this is no new thing. Um, this has been going on since the 1580s when um, uh, the, 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 they were the um, young writers um, would come out of Oxford and Cambridge, did come out of Oxford and Cambridge um, and felt themselves several cuts above um, the theatre people who had, were not university educated. Um, you know, famously, um, the Oxford and Cambridge crowd thought Shakespeare was um, several, several cuts below them. Uh, it's nothing new that people come out of somewhere like Cambridge. Um, they've, been, they've been taught well. They've had a tremendous opportunity to get involved in student drama. Um, they think that's the story. Um, when I started, I came into a profession where at least, where, where a good proportion of the people who were at the same time as me trying to become directors were ex-actors, ex-stage managers, people who had been to drama school, not to university. They knew already what I found out quite slowly and painfully, which is that um, uh, there's, um, there is a delicate line to be trod by all as aspiring directors. On the one hand, you do have to somehow measure up to the job title. On the other hand, when you start, you literally know less about every element of the craft of putting a play together than anybody else in the room. Uh, and you can only really find that out by doing it, um, by, uh, for instance, the business of directing actors. They always know more about acting than you do, unless, they, uh, uh, unless as a director, you've been an actor yourself. Um, they've always had the training you haven't had. Um, you have to be pretty alert to your own shortcomings and, and register when what you're saying is useful and when it isn't. So to circle back to your original question, yeah, I think even in, the, in my approach to um, to being what is in effect the editor of a new play, certainly in my approach to classical texts, um, it's very much still with me, my, um, my time at Trinity Hall, but it also always has a red flag um, waving above it. Uh, if you ever in a rehearsal room start to talk as you would in a supervision, you failed. It's not, that's not how it works. So pre presumably, while you were at Trinity Hall, you were um, studying English, but you were also, um, as you were saying, acting and, and beginning to direct for, for the first time. Um, what about that extracurricular, how, how, um, the, the, the work you were doing in the theatre at the time as an undergraduate? Um, how useful was that? It was oh, it's incredibly useful. It, it really incredibly useful. It's, it's a really embarrassing fact, really embarrassing fact that 
um, when I became director of the National Theatre, um, I was the fifth director of the National Theatre. Uh, and my, my four of us, my three predecessors, had all read English at Cambridge. Uh, the first director of the, of the National Theatre, uh, Laurence Olivier, had, had not. He was an actor. He was the Shakespeare. He didn't, he didn't need all the Cambridge nonsense. Um, what you got, and, and you know, I was at Cambridge in the 70s. I think, I think we had it lucky in so many ways. Um, we weren't, um, I mean, there are books to be written about this and there have been. We weren't fixated on what we were going to do with our degrees. Um, uh, there was, um, I was, I was allowed by the people who taught me, um, by my tutor, to be extraordinarily uh, flexible about when I worked and when I didn't. And I, I did what I guess, I don't know, you tell me, it still happens, which is I got far too immersed um, in the theatre. Um, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't know whether undergraduates can do that these days. Um, I, and I'm sure what I got was the same as what undergraduates still get, um, which is that, uh, you get, you get by trial and error, by making terrible mistakes, um, to um, to know in a very kind of um, um, uh, skin deep way, um, you get to kind of know how to put a show together. You get to, you know, you get to, you get in a very very crude and basic way to market it, to cast it. Um, to work out how to spend what little money you have on um, on the physical aspects of the production. That's all great. Um, it's um, it, 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 you, you, you find out pretty pretty quickly. It's not the whole story. Although, you know, um, now for young directors coming out of universities, um, there are not many of the opportunities that I had to um, to assist to go work in regional repertory theatres, there are more opportunities to put your own to shows together on the London Fringe, which comparatively barely existed when I started. And it was, uh, and it was your experiences at Cambridge and in the, th the theatre at Cambridge that convinced you you weren't going to be an actor, but you wanted to be a director. Um, can you say something about how, uh, how you came to that realisation? Well, I could see people doing it much better than me. Um, and I think um, I think the mechanism within me, which recognized almost immediately, uh, I'm not really that great, is the same mechanism that the same form, the same way of looking at, at things that is the bedrock of a director's mentality. An actor, the, an actor and a director focus in completely different ways. Um, an actor, th th this, this sounds banal, but it's true. An actor has to look at the world um, through one pair of eyes. An actor has to, um, for the duration of the shot or the play, um, to they have to totally immerse themselves um, in one way of looking in, uh, at the world. There are actors who are chameleons and there are actors who are you know, at the other end of the spectrum, always about self-revelation. But what they have in common uh, is a way of tuning out um, what uh, the rest of the world might look like from everybody else's point of view. They are entering um, a story and a character um, uh, as one sensibility. Uh, as soon as you're outside yourself, recognizing that you are no good, and you know pro probably more particularly that they are no good, and they're standing in the wrong place, uh, and I wish the door had been put in that place rather than in that place. And in any event, why are we doing this play um, uh, in a in a in a in a naturalistic fashion when it would be so much better um, with all that nonsense swept away and 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 what the, the the whole world that's been created for this play is wrong and the uh, the, the, the approach of the, this director's approach to reality is wrong all that as soon as you start thinking that then your your head is filled with all the stuff that prevents you from acting well so um 
So you think of oh, since since I have um, uh, it, it, since, since I'm um, since I know lots of things um, like the fox um, rather than one big thing like the hedgehog. I think I better be a direct all director of the foxes. I'm really interested in the description you gave a moment ago of, um, especially as a young director, being in um, in a theatre with actors who have much more experience than you, and yet you're directing them. And that, that's particularly challenging when you're starting out uh, as a new director. Um, how did you how did you find that? What what skills are required to enable you to direct actors who are vastly more experienced than yourself when, when you're just beginning? It's, it's not, it, it, the, the, it's, there's, there's no key to it. Um, simply going, I have no idea. Simply going, you know so much more than me. Um, that's not useful to anybody. Uh, on the other hand, um, trying to tell actors how to act, um, I'm, I'm trying to remember now um, some of the early experiences I had with vastly more experienced actors than me. Um, it, 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 would, it would not work. I mean, I'd, 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 um, you know, if I think of some of, if, if I, if I think, think of some of the truly great actors I've worked with, um, even now, um, you know, trying to tell Maggie Smith how to act, it's not what's useful to her. Uh, what's useful is creating the circumstances, creating the scene, providing the image, and sometimes getting into the particular form of analysis that she needs to go through um, to get to where she wants to be. Act, all actors have different processes. Very few directors in our theater get to create the process through which, other, through which the actors in their company act. Um, that's much more a continental European thing where actors stay together with the same director for years and years and years, exploring the whole idea of what theater is together. Um, once that's happened, um, then quite genuinely a director can create with an ensemble of actors a way of making theatre. The, you know, the great mid 20th century director, theatre directors, director writers, um, you know, classically Brecht at the Berliner Ensemble, they all acted in the same way. They all approached acting in the same way. Peter Brooks actors at um, the Bouffe du Nord in Paris, they all acted in the same way. Um, it does, doesn't happen in our theatre. Um, some actors like to some actors like to take apart a, 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 a character apart the way they would um, in a in a supervision. They tend maybe to have started um, at university before they went on to train. Um, others really, really, really don't want all that stuff. Um, you, as as a young director, you have to start to sense. Um, sometimes by trial and error, what works with different actors? What works with different writers? Um, there are some playwrights who have done all the work before they give you the play. Um, there are others who, um, who want immediate and, and, um, and quite extensive collaboration, maybe not just with the actor, maybe with the, no, with the director, maybe with a group of actors as well. You know, I, uh, so there, are some, there are some playwrights who are relatively easy to direct in that um, you either like the play or you don't. Martin McDonough, who, who I really, really like as a playwright, um, it's watertight by the time he gives it to you. Um, uh, I'm going to do a play later this year by Nina Ray. Um, it's watertight. I, 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 it was commissioned a while ago, taken a very taken four or five years for her to write. Um, uh, it was it it was our idea, so it's it, it's it's not as if this is something that um, uh, it, it's a play about it's a play about Bach, the composer, um, which 
I asked her to write for an actor, Simon Russell Beale. Uh, this is, and yet, uh, it, it, and if I'd been a movie mogul and asked her to do that, almost de rigueur in that, we would now be going through the process of taking it apart and making it like every other movie you ever saw. Um, Nina delivered a play, where I, don't, I really don't know what to say about this, except yes, please, can we do it? Um, uh, other writers, that, I mean, the, you know, the writer I've worked with most often, Alan Bennett, gives a, uh, gives a first draft, which is begging for intervention. That's how he likes to work. Neither, neither way is better than the other. Actors are the same. Some actors, some actors build from very, very slender foundations. You, it, it's, um, and sometimes my job is to do the best possible first production of a new play that I can. And sometimes it's to take an extraordinarily familiar play and make it seem as if it's new. Um, the, the, you know, the jobs are related, but they're not the same job. That's fascinating to hear what you said about Alan Bennett, who, as you say, you've worked with on, on a number of occasions, um, yeah. whether it's the Madness of King George, the History Boys, yeah. uh, Talking Heads. And you say that his um, process of hi composition on his part is to work with the director uh, to see how to see how lines land and that kind of thing. Is that? Um, well, it's again. It, yes, it is. He 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 knows how to write a line. You but you never have to say to Alan. That's just the hardest thing to say to a writer. Um, this is this is just badly written. Um, I just don't like. I, 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 I don't think this will. I don't think this speech will hold hold the audience's attention because it. But because it's badly written, this which you think is funny isn't funny. You never have to do that with Alan. No, Alan's particular thing is that. He's um, he's he's always looking to know from the first response what the play is about. Uh, doesn't want to talk about it in depth, but it's quite often. Sometimes the play comes extraordinarily baggy. The History Boys was about twice as long um, in its first draft as it ended up being, and it was not a short play, and it missed. The, the, the first draft did not have three or four of the key scenes because in the back and forth process, um, first of all, I thought you are holding back from certain things, which I know you want to write. And secondly, uh, you haven't quite found the center of it yet. Um, you remember the History Boys, one very, very memorable scene, uh, the scene at the end of the first half, it's just as memorable in the movie, when the Richard Griffiths character, the teacher, teaches the, um, the lonely kid, Posner, um, Drummer Hodge by Thomas Hardy. It's a beautiful scene, beautiful poem. Um, that scene came in response to I'm remembering now, a specific note from me, which was, uh, I can't tell from this baggy first draft whether you're telling me that this is a great teacher who is teaching at the wrong time in the wrong school under the wrong circumstances, or whether he's actually um, in these dazzling scenes, which are so funny where he you know, which are theoretically general studies classes, whether he's just a kind of clown and a maverick. And my opinion was, and so was Alan's, I knew it would be, it's a much more interesting play if, it's, if he's a great teacher. If he's a great teacher, we need to see him teaching um, in a way that is inspiring and revelatory. Um, and the other thing I said, unrelated was, when he loses his job, as he does at the end of the first half of the play, it doesn't appear to matter to him um, in the first draft. It must matter, it must matter, doesn't it? And that scene was the playwright, it doesn't work. The way it doesn't work, if you're working with a playwright like Alan, first time round, is you don't, I don't at least say, what I think you need here is a scene between Hector and Posner in which Hector, Hector teaches Posner 
something that reveals their mutual loneliness and how good he Hector is at opening up the whole world of English poetry. You don't say that. You That's a playwright. That is how playwrights work. It's how creative writers work. But saying this play feels like it lacks uh, an effective ending to the first half, um, an important thing about the central character and the central character isn't responding in a way that I find emotional, sat emotionally satisfying to the big thing that happens to him in the first half. That's, um, that's how Alan Bennett works. Um, Nina's play, <laughs> we spent four or five years talking about Bach and how the play might be. And indeed, what, maybe Nina has more recently herself um, been part of, you know, um, university um, tutorials because <laughs> you know it started with showbiz Simon Russell Beale is a brilliant pianist a great musician a phenomenal actor he looks a bit like Bach I really want to do a play about music I've never done a play about music um, I know we could sell tickets and there was a story about Bach that always particularly intrigued me, which was a famous story about how towards the end of his life, he went, he went grumpily. He was, he was a brilliantly grumpy man. So that's also good showbiz. He, he, Bach was constantly in fights with the authorities, um, you know, and did things like stab the bassoonist for not playing well enough and that kind of stuff. And it's all good, all good for the theater. But the thing that intrigued me was the visit he played to, paid to Frederick the Great in, in Potsdam, where his son, Carl, was court, was court composer, court musician. Um, and it's, gen at, it's generally thought that um, between them, Frederick the Great and Bach's son cooked up a scheme to humiliate Bach by trying to get him to write a fugue on a theme that it was impossible to write a fugue around because fugues were old fashioned and old Bach was old fashioned. And the new Bach, the Carl, Bach, Carl Philip Emanuel Bach was writing music in the new style, the Italian style, the easier on the ear style. And in a, so it's kind of um, a metaphorical parasite going on. Um, I thought that was the play. Nah, it's not what she's written. And I kind of knew a year or two ago that what she was writing about was um, kind of, she's a she's a wonderful playwright Nina. She the thing that interested her was this is a family of musicians. Bach's father was a musician. All Bach's children were musicians. His wives were musicians. He had two. Uh, the first one died. Um, what's it like when all these people who do the same job um, revolve around the one who does it best? And even better the less talented son becomes more successful and more famous in both their lifetimes. Brilliant. Um, it's there though, it's there. I don't have to do anything to it, except now try and do it as well as possible. Yeah, yeah. That, that's taken us um, right to some of the projects that you're working on at the moment. I, um, if I may, I'll take you back to, um, I mean, we, we must talk about Miss Saigon. Um, and uh, this was a play that you did um, in 1989, uh, a musical and, I mean, really must have been transformative um, for your career and your life. I wonder if you could say how, um, how that came about for you, first of all. Well, it was, it was transformative in that it, it was the one, my one, um, it was one of my very few until we opened the bridge, which is uh, the, the, my, the new theatre that uh, it's, uh, three, four years, three years old uh, by Tarbridge in London. It was, it, it was my good fortune that, a career spent mostly in the subsidized sector. Um, it was only my second or third foray into the commercial theater and it, the commercial producer involved Cameron McIntosh was at the time making these enormous global hits. And it was, it was a, it's a big pop opera, um, Miss Saigon. It's big, heart on sleeve, extravagant, emotionally extravagant, physically extravagant. Um, kind of modern retelling, or it was 1989. Um, it was uh, Madame Butterfly. It was it was openly based on the Madame Butterfly story set around the fall of Saigon. It was 
um, sentimental but truthful in that it was written by um, uh, two French guys who who had who were who who were openly sentimental, and it's it's a kind of it was it was extraordinarily popular piece of theatre with an extraordinarily popular score, and it did it went all over the world. It went to Broadway and the lot, um, and and it it had a, it had an impact on my life financially, but it's it. It, it, I went straight back to the National Theatre, and it, it was it was Alan Bennett really that was it was Alan Bennett that it was the madness of George the Third that um, that meant that I was I was asked to make the movie of the man or Alan didn't want to make the movie unless I directed it, which was an extraordinary act of faith since I never had directed a movie before. It was it was that that opened doors to me in the movie world. Um, mixed blessing, I'm not that, I, I, it's not something that I've ever felt um, I do particularly well. Um, and it was staying, it was deciding to, to kick around, focus on working with Richard Eyre when he was director at the National, which was in retrospect, professionally the best decision that I made when I when I could have kind of decided that what I really wanted to do was hurl myself at large scale commercial theatre, because the 12 years I spent as director of the National were the consequence of knowing the National very well, of having done a body of work at the National, having learned how the National operates. And, and that has been the most professionally satisfying Part of my career until now I'm really I'm having a uh, well if, if if we were open I would be having just as good a time now as I had during the, my time at the National. Well can I, can I ask you about your time at the National then um, I think when you um, when you were appointed um, director of the National you um, you had a vision for what you could achieve and and what the National needed at the time um, could you say something about that and how far you feel that that vision was fulfilled? Well, do you know, one of the interesting things was that it, it, at the, it, I think probably this happens every time. You, uh, my formula for it was, well, we have to redefine every time there's a new director, what it means to be national theater. What does national mean? What does theater mean? Um, uh, what did it mean in 1963 when it was founded? What did it mean when um, William Archer and George Bernard Shaw and Harley Granville Barker first started talking about it. It took decades for it to happen. And what does it mean now in 2003? Um, and when I left in 2015, it was Rufus Norris's job who came after me to ask those questions again. Um, I wanted a more diverse repertoire, a more diverse audience. I wanted the work on stage and the audience to reflect more what the country outside looked, what particularly what London looked like. Um, I had various specific ideas, which I was very comfortable with, which were, how do we make ticket prices much cheaper for a great deal of the time? Uh, I still think that is the, best and most straightforward way of making sure that the audience um, it, it is, as, um, is as diverse as it possibly can be. The second way that runs in parallel to that is making sure that the work itself is diverse. I think there was a time when it was felt that the National Theatre, any repertory theatre, was doing its job um, if it was gathering uh, a cross section of the community to see the canon. Um, I think quite early on, I realized that's a fruitless mission. There is no reason why everybody should want to see the cherry orchard. Um, if you're the national theater, um, I felt um, that the canon had to be, uh, an important part of the repertoire, but that broadening the new repertoire, broadening uh, the way the canon was done, just 
finding more people from different places uh, to write stuff that appealed to um, different parts of the wider community and finding people who made theater in ways that would simply have been um, confusing in 1963. That's, it, that's where I started. And I'm absolutely certain that's where Rufus started as well. Did I go far enough? No, I've, I, I mean, you know, I'm, I am, I, 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 I realize now um, that, um, you know, to, to, to borrow terminology uh, from, from politics, um, I'm a reformist, not a revolutionary. Um, I think, you know, during the time that I was there, it's quite shocking, but look, looking back on it, that no woman had ever had a new play produced in the Olivier Theatre. Um, I think I didn't move quickly enough on making sure that women wrote half the new repertoire. By the last two or three years, actually, women were writing more of the new repertoire than men. Um, culturally, the repertoire became more diverse. Did it become diverse enough? No, plainly not. I, d I think that is always, um, it, it became, uh, you know, it's, uh, um, it was very important to, to me. Uh, we, did an, we did an okay job. By the time I finished it, it looked much more interesting from a representational point of view. Um, the acting company, the acting company, actually, the acting company at the national uh, at all the great theatres has has um, you know that started quite a while ago. Uh, all of that moved, but as in the wider world it never quite moves quickly enough. Um, so that, I th and I think that will, that will never be, that, that work will never be complete because the world changes. Um, I set out also in some respects um, to conserve in that I do still think and do still want the British theater more widely, um, to continue, as, uh, uh, to continue to renew the classical repertoire and to, and to keep the, and to, to, to continue to reinvent the classical repertoire. Um, I think we, 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 did, we did pretty well by Shakespeare. We did very, very well by late 19th, early 20th century Russian repertoire because we had, because one of my colleagues, Howard Davis was besotted by it. Um, we did badly by restoration comedy. Uh, I think it's a regret to me that restoration comedy, which I grew up watching, I used to think it was really entertaining. I can remember as a teenager thinking, what's more fun than people making jokes about cuckolds in big full bottomed wigs? It's getting, I mean, I, I wouldn't go anywhere near it now, I don't think, even though I still love it. Um, they're harder and harder to do. Um, student actors are less and less adept in, um, in its peculiar demands, uh, textual demands, more demanding than Shakespeare, really. Um, so on the one hand, to sum up, yeah, I think, I think it's a shame that, that I didn't really get to prove to everybody how good restoration comedy really was. Um, uh, I tried a couple of times. Uh, on the other hand, um, was the, was the theater, the repertoire or the audience representative enough in 2015? No, it wasn't, but it was a great deal more representative than it was in 2003. And you'd also, um, didn't you get a much, uh, a, a wider cross section of society coming through the doors into the theater? Um, I mean, you, you touched on that, but as well as better representation on the stage, um, you were also getting better representation. Yeah, definitely, definitely. But because, because you know, if you do, if you do a play, if first of all, if you, uh, if you, um, cheaper tickets is cheaper tickets means 
it, it's a it's a creative decision. You you know you you look at the budget for the year and you think what are we going to spend all this money on? And one of the things one of the things that we decided to spend it on and try to raise private money off the back of was cheaper tickets. There was also in 2003 quite a lot of spare capacity, so that's useful too because you can make a uh, um, a, a calculation that selling 100% of the house in the Olivier um, uh, at 10 pounds, 10 pounds and 20 pounds is better than selling 60% of it at full price um, or as good as. It's worth spending the extra on making it possible. It's worth spending less on, you know, lavish physical production. As soon as things are affordable, um, you have to get it was a pretty simple formula. Uh, if people can come for what it costs to go to a movie, um, they'll try unfamiliar stuff. You don't feel murderous if you come out of a bad movie. You feel murderous if you come out of a bad, uh, a bad play and you've paid a lot to see it. Um, actually, I think you even feel murderous if you've not paid that much to see it because I think you invest a great deal more in yeah. live performance. Uh, you, have, you have greater expectations of the kind of communion that you expect to happen in any live performance. It's why I think live performance, um, the, gr the great upside of the digital revolution for, uh, for the performing arts is nothing to do with digital. It is the fact that we're not digital. And I think when, when the pandemic ends, uh, it's why I'm optimistic about the future. It's why I think as soon as people feel they're safe to go back to watch, to, to, to hear music live, to watch theater live, to dance, um, to, to go out to clubs and dance, there'll be, they'll, they, there will be no shortage of, um, of, the, of, a, of, of a real passion to do that. Um, so I think people do invest more in the, the, in, in the theater and particularly they invest more if they paid a lot. And if they're not paying very much, they come and try stuff that um, they wouldn't otherwise try. And that means more people come. But you also, as I said, have to appeal directly to people, to, to a very basic um, desire amongst audiences. They want to see strange things. They want to see fantastical things. They want to see the world made in a way that it would never have occurred to them to see the world. But they also want to see themselves. Um, so if you put on a play by, um, you know, one of the very first plays I produced was by Kwame Kweama. It was set uh, in Hackney uh, in a cafe called Almina's Kitchen. The play was called Almina's Kitchen. And suddenly the audience was, was the kind of people who'd go to Almina's Kitchen. It's not, that is not rocket science, you know. Yeah, and you, you've brought us now, uh, uh, as well as an early production of yours, you've brought us right up to date with the effects of the pandemic and, and how theatre is, um, what, what your hopes are for theatre as we come out of, the, uh, of this lockdown and, uh, and for however long um, we're, we're beset by the present tribulations. Um, do you want to say something about your new venture, which is The Bridge, and, uh, and what you see for that over, what your motivation is for that and what you see happening over the next few years? Well, the bridge with my colleague Nick Starr, um, now joined by another colleague, Tim Levy. Nick uh, was the executive director of the National while I was the artistic director, and we wanted to go on working together. And uh, we thought that in London there was a possibility of um, making theatre work as a business without subsidy and without philanthropy. Um, uh, that 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 hadn't been tried before. Um, I love all the old Victorian theatres in the West End, but it, but it, it almost is an accident of the work I've done. I've never become uh, emotionally attached to the idea of the West End. And London is changing. We, it, it's a, the story of how we found the space where we built the bridge is, is long and pretty interesting, but we don't really have time for it. But in brief, we found this huge concrete void pre-existing in the basement of a new development next to Tower Bridge. Uh, as, a, as a condition of their planning permission, they had to find somebody cultural to come 
and take that space off their hands. Um, and that was, that was us. We built a 900 seat theater. Um, it, but the basements are really good for theaters because theaters don't want windows. And as long as you have the ground floor uh, for, uh, and the next to Tower Bridge with a great view for the audience to arrive through, um, you're sitting pretty. Uh, and our objective is to try is to try to make stuff with wide appeal, but the kind of stuff we like doing and we admire, um, and to grow. Uh, we want, to, we intend to open a second theatre. Um, we're looking for ways of um, of of making it possible uh, to uh, approach investors honestly with a proposition that is roughly um, we make good theatre. Um, it it, it, uh, it makes you money. Uh, and only time will tell whether that uh, formula is a true formula, but it's, it's, it's gone okay so far. It would not have gone okay. Uh, it would be dead and gone uh, if it hadn't, because we were a new business. We'd been going a little more than two years uh, when, when the pandemic struck. We had no cash reserves. You know, we'd we'd done okay for two years, uh, so we ran out of cash um, almost immediately. No, not immediately. We had uh, we we had we uh, we had like you know like actually in this we did not differ from any of the subsidised institutions up and down the country. They all had about we all had about enough to theoretically keep us going for six months. Uh, the furlough scheme was the first lifesaver. Otherwise we'd have just had to make everybody redundant. Um, our investors uh, lent the business some money. Uh, for a long time, it looked as if that's what we would have to do. Ask our investors to up their, up the, their original investment or to lend the business money. Um, and during the summer, I got really very involved in the campaign to persuade the government, the treasury, to come up with a culture rescue fund. And it genuinely never occurred to any of us that that fund would extend to the commercial sector. Uh, but as it turned out, the theater component of the culture rescue fund um, invited loan applications from commercial performing arts organizations. And we got, a, we got a substantial loan. And without that, I think we might have by now had to, um, had to sell the theater. So, it, but have, we got the loan, we're fine. We'll reopen at some point this year. Don't know when, sooner than, rather than later, I hope. And then as I say, I think the future is bright because I think doing this kind of thing, I'm really enjoying this conversation, but my hand on heart and probably it would have been a real hassle for me to come to Cambridge and spend an evening with you. Although I always enjoy doing that. So it's good that this is happening, but hand on heart, um, if I didn't have to do another Zoom call for the rest of my life, that would be no hardship. And I think the world is full of people who just want to go out. The fact that digital, the digital world has seen us through this prolonged period of isolation. It's great. What would we have done with, what would we have done without this? We'd have all gone even madder than we've gone. But I think, um, live, not, not just live music and live theater and live dance, but also, you know, pubs, cafes, sports. I, I think there's gonna, I, I'm, I'm trying to keep, I'm trying to keep my own spirits up, but I actually believe it. I think there's gonna be an explosion of it. 
I think, God, I think people just want to see other people. And yeah. they want to see them on stage as well, I think. Well, wouldn't, be, wouldn't that be terrific? Let's hope this, does, this experience really does rekindle a new um, enthusiasm for encounters with live art. Yeah. Oh, that would be really great. Um, we have about 10 minutes left and some questions have been coming in already and um, audience members um, can feel free to put more questions um, into the chat and, uh, and we can field some of those. Um, one of the first questions here is who were the actors you worked with at Cambridge who went on to be famous and do you feel you discovered any of them? No, I don't, I'm not sure I discovered anybody. Who, um, I wasn't, I wasn't, uh, who became most famous? The, the comedians, um, the Footlights uh, uh, crowd, um, Griff Rhys Jones, Jimmy Marvel. Um, it wasn't a vintage uh, generation. Um, I was older than Hugh Laurie, Stephen Fry and Emma Thompson, who were immediately after me. Um, so that's, um, well, you know, that's, they're not just funny, those three. <laughs> they, yeah. can, they can all do it. Yeah. Uh, there's another question. Um, is there a quality that makes a play spark that makes you want to put it on the stage? Yeah, well, that's, a, um, uh, 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 it's, for me, it needs to be about something that I feel connected to, that I can feel useful to, um, but, what grabs me, it the, in all honesty, what gets me beyond page 10 is the quality of the dialogue. If uh, that's not the whole story, but uh, the quality of the dialogue, which immediately pulls you into character and situation, but um, you, you it's really hard writing. It, there are playwrights who, who, there are very successful television dramatists who write truly terrible dialogue. Um, and I don't even need to tell you who they are because you watch that, you watch that kind of television. We all do. And we all know this dialogue is, sometimes we don't know because brilliant actors like Maggie Smith are persuading you that what they're saying is not in fact shit. Um, but uh, I, uh, as a, um, it won't wash on, doesn't wash on, it doesn't wash on stage. Um, uh, so quite simply, if the dialogue's good, I get interested in everything else too. Okay. Um, and which of Shakespeare's plays did you find most exciting to direct? Um, I've now done quite a lot of them. I've done more than half of them. Um, I have literally, I love, it's, it's one of the things I love doing most. Um, I've never had a bad time. I've done some of them better than others. Uh, it's an impossible question, which is most exciting? Uh, you know, I could dodge it by saying the one I'm gonna do next. Um, I've done plays which I knew to be completely thrilling beginning to end, like Hamlet, um, and, ha and that's thrilling. Henry V, I thought, was not as good, as subtle, as ambiguous, um, as, uh, uh, um, as rich as it turned out to be. Um, uh, I never, Julius Caesar, I had no idea that it was, they're, they're always better than you think they're going to be. Um, at the two I've done at the bridge, most recently, Julius Caesar and Midsummer Night's Dream, which involved 400 of the audience members being part of the action, walking around the action. I found those very exciting to do. I'm going to do Macbeth next, which I never thought I would do. Um, and, and so therefore, I am extremely ex excited by Macbeth. Uh, when, when, will, when will, will Macbeth be staged? When will the theatres reopen? Okay. <laughs> Good answer to a bad question. No, um, no, no, it's a good question. It's a good question. I have a date. At the, I have yeah. a date. I, I could give you a date, but I won't because it would be tempting fate. So um, <laughs> we will just look forward to it. Yeah. Um, how do you deal with traveling productions when it comes to vastly different spaces? And how does the space alter your approach to setting drama? 
uh, you, you can't really, if, if a, a traveling production, a touring production, the, the tour is generally, um, in, in fact, always uh, designed to go around the show or the show is designed to go around the tour. Um, the, um, uh, the, 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 the space itself, the nature of the space, the shape of the space, how the space is adaptable, yes, has an in, as a, as a, whether the space is big or small, has a big effect on how you do a play. Some plays just shouldn't be done in big places. Um, uh, there are plays, you know, Chekhov, Shakespeare, if you do them in front of 200 people, um, you do them completely differently from the way you do them in, if you do them in front of a thousand people. It's almost impossible to fail with Shakespeare or Chekhov if you can do them quietly for 200 people. The, the, the experience of being in proximity to one of those plays is, is almost infallible. Um, Turing, is, Turing is a big practical issue. Uh, uh, in order to tour, you have to make a show that you know is going to fit the network of theatres you tour it to. It's one of the reasons we started uh, NT Live at the National, the, not, which is not as good. It, um, it's a different from seeing stuff live, but at least it gives a facsimile of the experience absolutely everywhere. There are parts of the country where there simply aren't big enough theatres to take the kind of shows that the National by and large does. Another question has come in. Do you see the heart of British theatre in the subsidised or commercial sector or a combination of the two? Yeah, definitely a combination of the two. They are symbiotically attached. Uh, the commercial theatre would sim the commercial theatre would implode without the subsidised theatre. Um, it's not an exaggeration to say that, to a very large extent, the commercial theatre has certainly outsourced the development and production of new drama to the subsidised sector. There are one or two commercial producers who produce plays straight into the West End, um, but you, you know. Um, Sonia Friedman produced Tom Stoppard's new play, Straight into the West End. It's Tom Stoppard. That's, that's why. Um, otherwise, the supply of new drama, straight drama, spoken drama in particular, uh, into the West End um, would, would, would be not non-existent, but, but fatally reduced without what the, the subsidised theatre does. And the subsidised theatre has the commercial theatre to look to as a kind of benchmark of what connects widely. It's an irony that, um, although I have spoken so much about ticket price, um, the really popular stuff, the really demotic stuff that runs to loads of people for ages is actually quite expensive and it's in the West End. There is something about the West End brand which is not forbidding. It's a great night out. There's something about the National Theatre that is, we, you know, we have the experience of taking shows sometimes from the National to the commercial West End, the big wicked commercial West End. And the audience that pitched up in the West End, you thought, why don't you come to the National? There's something about National Theatre. There's something about, there's something about the, um, the subsidized brand, which, to its detriment, our fault is forbidding. Um, and I know about it because I go, because I want to, because it's my thing. I go to the kind of shows which are made by and for ultra cool 20 somethings in London. It's really scary sometimes for, um, for a 60 something guy to go to these ultra cool places which feel really exclusive. They're not exclusive. Any, they're made by and for 20 somethings and that's what's, and that's where the action is. But I get why, I get why the theater can sometimes feel forbidding. Have you ever been to the theater in Berlin? It's the most terrifying experience. You think, um, I, there is no parallel universe in which I could be as cool and as serious and as dressed entirely in black as this crowd. I think the theater sometimes repels um, the wider public um, 
not just just by nature of the fact that when it's at its most cutting cutting edge and exciting, um, it's um, it, it, its audience is self defining. Great. I, ha I have another question, which is, um, what is your favourite memory from student theatre? Playing the dame in the Footlights Panto. Easy. Is, is there any video footage? No, I don't think there is. I don't think, I'm very glad there isn't. I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm sure I wasn't even that good, but, but, um, but it was, um, I, I think two weeks it ran. I think I've never enjoyed two weeks more. And I've got one last question, um, which is, uh, uh, can we expect a play about Brexit, the pandemic, or US elections in the foreseeable future? Um, yes, I'm sure they will. I'm sure those plays will come, but I'm not sure they will. I, I think, um, I'm not sure that's what we do best. Uh, it's sometimes instant response plays. Uh, are very, David Hare's very good at them, and there are, uh, James Graham's very good at them. Um, there are other playwrights who are good at them, but I think the I think I think the, the when the when the great play about Brexit arrives, it won't be about Brexit, if you know what I mean. Um, and you know, when I did Julius Caesar, yeah, it's about a it's about um, a populist. It is about a. Uh, it, it's about uh, an elite um, revolution, which fails in it, which fails because um, one particular member of the elite um, manages to manipulate the mob against against the um, you know you could say uh, the self interested um, quasi democratic oligarchy. Um, was, Julius Caesar was done a lot over the last four years. It was a production in New York in Central Park where Caesar was literally Trump. It became a great co -celeb. Um, uh, Theatres all over America, James Shapiro, the, 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 the really kind of throw-grabbingly readable um, uh, Shakespeare uh, the critic, uh, has, has written about this. He, his most recent book, uh, the title of the book, I can't remember, but it's basically Shakespeare in America, a history of the United States through the way it has responded to and performed Shakespeare. He's written brilliantly about this saga, where literally during the summer that the public theater performed Julius Caesar in Central Park, um, at the center of the production was a man looking like Donald Trump, the wig, the tie, the lot, being assassinated. Um, Shakespeare festivals all over America were basically got death threats. Um, it, it's it was so. <laughs> lots of people were doing Trump, but I don't think they were doing Trump. I think they were using Trump to say, um, and they were using you know nationalist populism to say, look how alive these plays are. Um, it's a two-way street. I think it's not that there will be necessarily any time soon a great play about Trump or even a great play about what it was that gave rise to Brexit, but those social currents um, can be pulled in to illuminate plays old and new that are ostensibly about other stuff. Um, uh, uh, it's um, I, I don't, I don't I, yeah okay we hold as to the mirror up to nature but actually I think holding the mirror up and just saying this is a reflection is usually pretty flat and pretty pretty boring I think I think there is some kind there is as you know some kind of transformative process that needs to take place um, for for art to become interesting. The first director who puts on stage the fur hat and the horns, you know, I think that 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 director should give up. Um, but I can absolutely guarantee you that at some point over the next year, 
several times, you will see a production of something or other, and that person will come onto the stage. Painted face, bare chest, Viking horns. Yeah. I'm out. I'm out. As soon as he arrives, I'm out. <laughs> Well, Nick, this has been absolutely fascinating. It's been a real pleasure to hear you talk about British theatre, about your own career and experiences, and, and also uh, your time at Trinity Hall. So we're really very grateful for your time and um, um, for talking to us so engagingly. Uh, we ha we've had more questions than we've had time for, but um, uh, we're going to have to wrap it up now. So um, thanks once again, and, and thanks to everyone for, for joining us. Thanks. Uh, thank you. I really enjoyed it, Daniel. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks. Me too. Bye.